Thank you. Well, what a great uh, story. And um, it's been a great day already just to be able to worship and be able to lift our voices and, and rejoice in God's goodness. Uh, today, we're coming to the very last of our uh, narratives through the book of Acts, uh, verse, um, or chapter 27, 28. So you might wonder why are we reading in, in Mark. Well, as the story unfolds, you'll, you'll see why that is. Um, I was reading through these uh, chapters, and in particular, I suppose, it struck me how sometimes uh, things don't work out the way we expect them to. And plans can unravel in a serious way. There was a, a, a great uh, TV series where the catch line used to be, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, Mark and I have sort of uh, discovered over the years that perhaps a more appropriate um, motto for us is, uh, uh, we cope fine when the plan unravels completely. Because often that's kind of how life works out. Things can go sideways. And often things can go sideways in terms of our walk with God, in terms of our life and family and ministry and just, just you know, maybe job, health, all kinds of things. And we find it really hard sometimes not to be afraid, not to struggle. And I want to take a little bit of time to look at this narrative today and understand a principle of the Christian life, and that is that things do not always work out according to plan. That God has placed us in a fallen world. And as God's people, we are not immune from having life go sideways. And sometimes that might be the result of circumstances beyond our control. Sometimes it can interact with our, with our own insecurities and our own bad reactions. But one of the great things is, you know, God has put us in a fallen world. He's put us in a fallen world, in a broken world, to live among broken people, to live in the midst of dysfunction. And when we think about that, it's not unlike his own life, isn't it? The Lord of glory came to live amongst us, fallen people in a broken world in the midst of terrible dysfunction. And his redemptive purpose, his plan for a lost world, for a broken world, is to use living, breathing agents in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that dis dysfunction to reveal himself. And so we're going to come today, we're going to see that uh, the, the, the plans of the dear Apostle Paul did not work out at all how he expected, but nevertheless, in spite of that, that God was working out his plan. So let's pray. Father, we just come to your word this morning and thank you, Lord, that, the, that it's rich to instruct us, to lead us, to direct us, to help us find, Lord, the, the harmony with what you're trying to do in your purpose through us. We pray, Lord, that as we come this morning, Lord, maybe there are some here amongst us and life has gone very much sideways for them. And we want to pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see your hand in it all, to see your purpose in it all, to understand, Lord, the great calling, the great privilege, the great joy that we have to prove that you are enough, even in the midst of life when it goes completely sideways. We just thank you for this and pray, Lord, you'd open your word to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the book of Acts, um, we come to... This, these last couple of chapters, you know, it's probably important for us to back up a little bit and understand where was Paul headed? What was Paul's mindset? Where was he thinking the last few chapters of the book of Acts was, was going to work out? We, we had a great privilege of working through the book of Romans with some students uh, last trimester, and one of the things that was interesting as we looked in uh, Romans and um, chapter 15 is... Um, that in verses 23 to 29, Paul outlines what his plan was. He had a plan, and it was a very good plan. He was in the middle, he was at Corinth, and he was in the process of collecting uh, offerings from all the churches in Macedonia at the top of Greece through Archaea down the southern section. Uh, and his plan was to bring uh, the offerings from all of these different churches 
uh, and these um, Greek peoples to bring it to Jerusalem and to present a gift, a love gift from the Lord Jesus, from his people. And the idea was there in Jerusalem, there was famine, there was a great need, and his idea was, and the purpose was, this is Christ showing his love through his people. And in the process of that, to break down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, to see the compassion uh, of Christ expressed across the boundaries of the divide of, of the difference in ethnic background and culture. And so that was his plan. Uh, and he spells out his plan. He's, he says, look, my, my aim is to take these offerings, to go to Jerusalem, to present them there, to see this great celebration, this, this great uh, pouring of blessing and love, and then to be able to leave from there and go to Rome, to pop in to see Rome, to get your support, to garner your support, as we, we need to press on to take the gospel further to Spain. And that was his plan. And he, he basically says, I've run out of room here. There's, we've preached the gospel everywhere. We've run out of room. We want to take the gospel to these uh, new frontiers and for you to be partners with me in doing that, he tells the Romans. And so that was his plan. Now, when we look at the map, we can see that's a pretty simple plan. And if we flick up and have a look at the, the, the map that's mapped out there, this was his plan. This is the itinerary. This was what, uh, you know, Paul had booked his seats. He booked, booked his airfares. He was all set. And this is what he was going to do. He was going to head from Jerusalem uh, where he delivered the gift. He's going to go to Rome uh, briefly, get some support, and then press forward to the frontiers in Spain. When we look in the book of Acts, we see a very different story, don't we? We look at from Acts 25 onwards, and the story is, um, is quite different. The map that we've got on the, the next map coming up shows you what actually happened. And it's the story of what happens here in Acts 27 and 28. As we look at it, we see that the journey doesn't look like that at all. If we bring up the, the, um, the real story of what happens we can see here what, what's actually really transpired. And the first thing we notice when we look at this is when he went to Jerusalem, we find that, well, there was a very big difference between God's plan uh, and Paul's plan. It started when he went to Jerusalem by being arrested by an angry mob. And that mob caused him to be arrested and he was in jail for two years in Caesarea on the, on, the, on the coast from Jerusalem. And there's a procession, we remember a procession of authorities that, that examined Paul and put him on trial until eventually after over two years he's able to get away uh, and his appeal to Caesar was the only way he could get out of this uh, to go to Rome. So he thought, well, this is a plan. At least I'll get a, all expenses paid fair to Rome. Well, he did. But, you know, the quality of the journey wasn't quite the same. And so he sets out from, uh, from Caesarea. And if you look in uh, uh, Acts 27 and verse 4, you'll see there it says, putting... To see from there, we sailed under the uh, leeward side of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And we sailed across the open sea, across the coast of Cilicia. That's that little part just under the bottom of Turkey there. And you see there's a little gulf that goes up in Pamphylia there, that little gulf as he sails across. And on the town there, if you can see it, um, uh, that's um, um, Myra. So... The wind's against him, and the journey's becoming tedious and late. Uh, he says in verse 8, he says he found, the centurion found a ship in, of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty. Uh, and that's right at the very end of the, the western end there of Turkey, a place called Snidus, and it says that we were, we were in trouble. The wind didn't allow us to go any further, and we sailed um, under the shelter of Crete, which is that island there. 
And it blew them off course. It, it was a headwind. It, it was a real problem for them. Things were not going to plan at all. They were getting further and further behind. He said, we, we sailed slowly for a number of days. Um, and, it, and it says there that casting, uh, coasting along with difficulty, we came to a place of fair having. They had to creep their way along the coast of Crete. It was very difficult going. They get to fair havens. And you see, then they realize that it's so late that it's in a very dangerous time of the year. And so they, they decide, well, what are we going to do? Fairhavens is right on the, the southern coast. It's very exposed, not a good place to be there in the winter. So they thought, well, let's sneak along to the very western extremity of Crete. There's a place called Phoenix. We'll, we'll see if we can get in there. And you can see on the map there, as they started out toward Phoenix, the wind was so bad, it, it says a hurricane arose and blew them off the coast and out to sea. In fact, it blew them nearly to Libya. And the storm was so bad, and people think the Mediterranean is not that bad a place. It's interesting, during the war, two Italian warships were sunk because of storms in this region. And so Paul was in a really perilous situation at this point. And the ship was in a, a real difficult situation. And so they were struggling, they, they were they kind of uh, battling with this wind and you can see they meandered their way back around, back northward toward Italy. But of course what happens is they get shipwrecked and we see the story. If you look in um, Acts 27, you can see what, what happens. It, it tells us um, that in verse 13, when the south wind blew Blew gently, supposing that they obtained their purpose to get to Phoenix. It says they weighed anchor along Crete and close to the shore, but soon a tempest wind struck from the land. And when the ship was caught, couldn't face the wind, we gave it way and were driven along, and running under the lee of a small island called, trying to get some shelter. Uh, they, they hid behind this little island called and we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat and after hoisting it up they used supports to undergird the ship fearing that they would run aground and it says they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along so they were sort of trussed up the ship and tried desperately to survive verse 18 says since we were violently storm tossed they became they came the next day to jettison the cargo and on the third day, they threw off the ship's tackle overboard with all of their, their own hands. And they couldn't see the sun or the stars, appeared for many days, had no idea where they were. No small tempest lay on us, and all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. And since they tried, they'd been without food for a long time. Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Here comes the I told you so. At Fairhavens, he told him, he said, hey, listen, it's too dangerous. We ought to stay here. But they pressed on. You know, when you read that story, you think, well, who's Paul telling the, the, the ship people what to do? But don't forget, for 10 years, Paul had uh, zigzagged across the Adriatic and the um, Aegean Sea quite a, quite a lot, the Aegean Sea. And he knew that this was dangerous time of the year, not a time to be at sea. And so he stands up to them and says, um, this is, I told you so. <laughs> he says, uh, if you had listened to me, uh, we wouldn't be in this situation. Um, but he says to them, and this is really interesting, he says to them that God had spoken to him. He says in verse 24, he said to them, do not be afraid. He said, God has spoken to me. It says, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. And so God gave him a word. And even though he, was, he probably had some credibility as somebody who who they should have listened to, he gives them a reassurance and the word that God was going to protect them. And then, of course, you've got this interesting twist in the story because the, they, the, the sailors realize that we're in, we're, our, our goose is cooked here. And so they're, they're, they're sounding out the depths 
uh, and they, they're trying to cast anchors from the, the back of the boat. And under a pretext, they come up with this scheme. The, the sailors say, let's, let's tell them we need to get in the, in the ship, in the, in the, in the lifeboat, and, and, and help put out the anchors at the front, but we'll use it as a trick so we can actually skedaddle and get away and leave them to it. So Paul realizes what's going on, and he says to the centurion, he says, don't, don't let the, you let these guys get in this ship, and we're gone. We're done. And so the soldiers go with their swords, and they chop all the ropes of the, of the boat, the small boat that the, the sailors are banking on, and it drops into the sea, and it's gone. And so the sailors, I, I don't know how popular Paul was with the sailors, but he obviously was, had the ear of the centurion. And the result is that the, the ship starts to break up on the reef. And so they, they grab whatever they can that floats, and they, they make their way in dribs and drabs to the beach, and they get to Malta which is they didn't know where they were because they didn't have any navigation. But it says in verse 39, when it was day, they didn't recognize the land. They noticed a bay with a, uh, on the beach, and they thought, well, we'll run the ship ash ashore here. So they cast off the anchors. They left them in the sea, and at the same time, they loosened the ropes, and they just let it go, and it hit the reef, and it started to break up, and then they made their escape. Now, the soldiers then decided, well, we better kill these prisoners because they're going to get away. So talk about getting out of the frying pan into the fire. Fortunately, Paul had some credibility with the centurion, and he wouldn't let him do it, but it was a near-run thing, and he saved Paul's life. And then it says in verse 28, in chapter 28, it says, we were brought safely through and we learned that the island we were on was called Malta. And the native people showed us kindness. And so they were building a fire on the beach. And this viper, this scorpion, I don't know what it was, comes out and bites Paul on the, as you know, just when you think things can't get any worse. <laughs> and lo and behold, it did get worse. And so everyone's thinking, oh, this guy must be a terrible person. He must be a murderer. You know that he's going to die. And so they, they were watched. Instead of anything happening, no reaction, no swelling, no, no symptoms. And they decide he must be a really good person. And then the story goes on a little further. And, and we see, you know, one trial after another, after another. And, and you would think to yourself... How does this work? Us being the people of God, being somebody who's God's messenger, to be in fear, uh, in peril for your life, things going so badly. And we think about the other shipwreck that we read about in Mark's gospel. And I was thinking about this, you know, if things don't work out the way we expect. The disciples got in the boat. They had a plan to get across the lake. Everything was fine. The, this storm blows up. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Must have been absolutely exhausted. And they wake him up and they said, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? And sometimes, you know, when the circumstances are all discombobulate and out of whack. That's our immediate fear is, don't you care? You're oblivious. God's not paying attention. Life's going so far sideways here, and God is not paying attention. God not only is paying attention, but he's in full control. And not only is God in full control of the circumstances, but God's control is driven by his complete and utter steadfast loyal love for us. There is no safer place to be than a child of God in the hand of God. And it doesn't matter how severe the storm is. And if we read in Mark 8 there, you see that it says the waves beat against the ship and it started to sink. And I guess the Apostle Paul had the same sinking feeling. And they cried out. They said, don't you care that we're, 
we're sinking. And Jesus immediately stood and, and cried out and said, peace, be still. Now, I don't know what kind of response the disciples were expecting. I don't know if they were expecting some word of encouragement like Paul gave them. Don't worry, God will get you through. No, that's not what happened. I'm sure they were absolutely surprised to see that Jesus decided he would talk to the storm and told the storm to calm down. And as far as the eye could see around the Sea of Galilee, all they could see was this storm and the whole, uh, the whole meteorological system just cooled it and calmed down. Now, that was pretty dramatic. And Jesus turns to them and he says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? Now, I look at that verse and I ask myself, Lord, are you not paying attention? The, the ship's about to sink. You look in Paul's circumstance, you know, as they run aground, the ship's breaking up and why are, you not, why are you so fearful? Why are you so afraid? Lord, anybody in his right mind's going to be afraid. Should we not be fearful? When life goes sideways, should you not be fearful? I was thinking about dear brother and his wife and his family. Um, I was on the board for 10 years or so of um, Christian Community Ministries, and one of our schools was Staines Memorial College. Gladys Staines is a surviving widow of our husband, Graham, who was 58 when he died, and his two boys, Timothy, was six. Philip was 10. And they were in India. And just the dad, Graham, and the two boys were in the car. There was a riot. These in Indian um, uh, independence people caused this riot and they, over the gospel that he'd been preaching. And they were, they were surrounded the car. They were beating on the car. I imagine, I imagine Graham Staines turning to his sons. Don't be fearful. And then they set fire to the car. And the three of them perished in the flames in that car. Was that a time to be fearful? You know, sometimes... God's plan is not what we expect it to be. And we do not have a promise that we are going to negotiate life without a problem. There is no promise in the scripture that says that we are going to avoid those kinds of tragedies, those kinds of problems. And so we look at it and we say, well, how can we not be fearful? It's interesting when you look in Acts uh, in, in Mark 8, and you look at those verses, you look at the verse where, where they say to him, where he says, why are you so fearful? And the next verse it says, and they were fearful, exceedingly fearful. But there's two different words for fear in that story. When Jesus says, why are you fearful? He's speaking of a word from which we get the word phobia from. It's a fear that extinguishes faith. It extinguishes courage. It's a word associated with cowardliness. But in the, in the next verse, when, when it says the disciples feared exceedingly, it's a different word. It's a word that is the kind of fear that, that summons our courage to believe. A reverence. A humility that, that is in reverence and fear before God who's in control. And so you might have real reason to be afraid. You might have real reason to be in fear and trembling. Jesus swept drops of blood in Gethsemane. So there is a place and a time when we're going to be fearful and terrified. In fact... When, when Paul is talking to the Philippians, he says, you are, you don't, don't be terrified by your adversaries. Your circumstances may strike fear into you, but, beloved, we need to be sure that we have a kind of fear that will 
that will draw on our courage to believe God for his sovereign love and care. And even if he takes us through the fire into glory, even if that was to be his will, we would, be, we would have a peace and an assurance that God is in control. This is an incredible story. When we look at Paul's story in Acts, we see how it works out. And one of the things we notice is that there was a reason that God caused Paul's plan to go sideways. Have a look in verse, in, in Acts 28, we see this. It says, when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man's a murderer, though he's escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however shook off the creature in the fire and suffered no harm. And they were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. It goes on and tells us in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man named Publius who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. And it happened the father of this man lay sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed. And putting his hands on him, he healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. And they honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board everything that we needed. You know, God allows us to do life in a broken world, in a fallen world, amongst broken people in the midst of dysfunction, and he does it for a reason, because he wants this world to see in flesh and blood what it looks like when his people know that he is enough. And that is the most powerful testimony that we can bring. Far more powerful than if God somehow was to ride shotgun on our circumstances and cause us to never actually have anything go out, out of whack. I wonder in your life, have things gone sideways? I wonder in your life, are there circumstances that strike fear into you? Maybe there's a health issue. Maybe there's some terminal disease that you're wrestling with. Maybe there's a broken relationship in your family that just tours at the very soul. Maybe it's insecurity about your job. Maybe it's broken relationships and we all know, many of us know what the pain of broken relationships can be like, even with our brothers and sisters. You think, God, why? Why? The why is because Jesus wants to manifest through you the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of hurting people, in the midst of people who have no answers, for us to be able to have the cry of a heart that says, who do I have in heaven but thee? There's nothing on earth I need beside you. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us be a people who respond when life goes sideways with that kind of a response, with that kind of reality. And maybe, maybe you're sitting here today and maybe you're not necessarily across the line yet. Maybe you've been hearing the gospel, you've heard about the claims of Jesus Christ on your life and you're not sure if you want to respond to him. I want to say to you that Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life, and we often say he came that you might have life and have it abundantly, but you will not have trouble-free life. And if you come to Christ and you surrender to him, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And as you walk with Jesus and as you allow his yoke and his control over your life, you will learn from him. And you won't have a walk that's painless. You won't have a walk that's trouble-free. You won't even have a walk that always ends up the way you wanted it to end up. But you'll, you'll have a walk of fellowship with God and the fullness of him within you to make you the person 
that he intended you to be. Knowing the joy of fellowship with a loving God. And our, our hope and our future is not in this world. As good as it can be and as much as a blessing many things in life can be, this is not where our fulfillment rests. You need to come to him. You need to surrender to him. You need to allow him to be Lord of your life, to fill you with the fullness of who he is so you can face life in a broken world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your presence. We thank you, Lord, for all the storms. And Lord, as we look out and we see on the horizon, we see the storms coming, Lord. We want to thank you for those storms. And we pray, Lord, that in those storms, you might reveal the reality of who you are through us to a lost and broken world. And so, Father, we come to you, Lord, and, and just in the quietness of our own hearts, Father, we want to just say to you, forgive us, Lord, if I have not trusted you in the midst of the storm. Lord, if I've not surrendered to you, if I've not been confident of you, Lord, if my heart has been overwhelmed with fear and anxiety that is driven by uh, the extinguishing of my courage and my faith, Lord, I, I confess that to you and I ask you, Lord, Lord, that you would give me the faith to trust you, to surrender to you. Lord, to believe, Lord, that you know what you're doing. To believe, Lord, that you're paying attention. To believe, Lord, that you love me. Believe, Lord, nothing is too hard for you. So, Lord, we come to you and surrender. And if you're here today, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and you're living life yourself, Jesus is knocking he wants to come in he wants you to surrender to him he wants you to allow him to be the one who walks with you through the storm who changes you on the inside to make you the kind of person he wants you to be you need to surrender to him today lord thank you for loving us and dying for us on the cross paying for our sin come in we surrender to you we ask you lord to make of us the people you called us to be and made us to be. We ask in his name. Amen.